Here we go with Stoic. All right, so um, all of our examples in Stoic are going to be dealt out here, or measured out uh, through three different uh, parts of the chapter. 7.2 will concentrate on mass and mole problems, and then we will get into uh, 7.3 where we'll take a look at some gas volume problems, since we were able to get moles from gases, and we'll take a look at some solutions, because we have molar concentrations, we can get moles from that. So you've just heard me use the word moles quite a bit. All right, stoichiometry is simply this. I must boil down whatever measurements I'm given for my balanced equation to a molar amount, and then it is a, a quantity that is comparable to the balanced molar coefficients in that equation. In other words, to do stoichiometry, the simple rule of thumb is you need to express your measurements in moles. If you do that, the whole process works out very simply. So, what is stoichiometry? Well, this is just uh, derived from the terms element measurement. So this is that idea I was talking about where we're trying to marry the balanced chemical equation and the parts and proportions that exist there to the actual measurements we might be doing in lab or in you know some sort of other chemistry problem. And so we have to be able to compare those two in order to be able to make predictions, look for efficiencies, and so on and so forth, but that will require uh, that will require us working within moles. If we're not working in moles, most quantities are not comparable through the process of stoichiometry. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to oversimplify this problem. Yes, as you guys start doing this, you will start to find shortcuts or exceptions to this I must be an explicitly moles rule. Um, we've already looked at a couple through the course. But if we stick to just one strategy, it's the same strategy every single question we do. Okay? So I want you guys to work very hard on trying to learn this strategy because it works effortlessly once you get it. But realize that this, uh, that this strategy you know, might add an extra step or two just to keep us all on the exact same page. So, here we go. The stoichiometric method is essentially a four-step method, all right? And it begins with, call it a fifth step if you like, the balanced chemical equation. If I do not have a balanced and correct chemical equation, then none of the math that I do from it will ever be appropriate or accurate. So be really meticulous here. Make sure that your equation and your balanced chemical reaction is correct, because if it is not, all the work that you do in stoic will be wrong accordingly. And because it's such a scaffolded skill, I don't award part marks here. You must be able to do the Chem 10 to do the Chem 20. Okay, so I am holding you guys to a standard here. So we start with the balanced chemical equation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to organize the information in a very specific way with that chemical equation. This might seem like a tedious, tiny part of the process, but as we get into Chemistry 30, there's going to be so much more to organize that this strategy is something we build upon and use. Okay? We may have to convert your given quantity. There's going to be some starting amounts. We know that we don't generally measure in moles in chemistry. There's no mole scales or anything like that in the lab. So we usually have to do a conversion. Once we have a quantity in moles, then I'm going to do this marriage to the chemical equation, and I'm going to compare the parts of the chemical equation, the mole ratio, to the measured amount of moles that I've got. This will allow me to predict all sorts of other molar quantities that will be used or produced in the reaction. From there, I may have to convert from my moles that I've got to some sort of new unit, because again, remember, moles uh, is just not that realistic a measurement that we're going to have, and so there's usually conversions. So I've got this flow chart here for you guys, and in the middle here is the stoichiometry. You're going to have moles of some sort of given quantity presented in the question or the lab. You're going to compare it through a mole ratio from your balanced equation, and this will allow you to infer the moles produced or the moles required for any other reactant or product. But you'll notice that it's this part that is the stoichiometry. Stoichiometry is really just moles times a mole ratio to predict moles of something else. 
What's the issue and what makes this a little bit tougher is all of the metric conversion that we might have to do to move between the common measurements we've seen and the moles that we related to. But think about it. Why did we learn molar mass? So that we could convert mass quantities to mole quantities. Why did we learn uh, the molar concentration of a solution? So we could move between volumes of solution and moles of solute. Why did we learn the universal gas constant or the molar volumes of gases at SATP or STP? So we could move between their measurements and a mole quantity. The same things are repeated on the other side, so more realistic problems will have a conversion going into stoichiometry and coming out of stoichiometry to express it in more usable values. So most of stoichiometry is going to be your metric conversion, and it's why we use the factor label method and all that good stuff. Okay, so let's get into it. Here are two of the most simplified and therefore unrealistic examples that we could give you in stoichiometry. It says, if you have 0.27 volt, uh, pardon, pardon me, 0.275 moles of silver nitrate solution, and I react it with excess or extra CaCl2, then the amount of precipitate I would get when measured in moles is how many? So a couple of things we need to do to set this one up. One, we see that CaCl2 is the excess, therefore AgNO3 is that limiting reagent we mentioned in the last section. This is the one that's designed to run out first and stop your reaction, much like firewood runs out before all the oxygen when you're having a campfire. So we have our two reactants, we need the balanced equation, so there's AgNO3, and we have CaCl2. And now I see that it's a double replacement reaction, and since I have two cations, they will just switch places, and I can predict my products. So calcium, a 2 plus ion, comes over here with nitrate, and so I get CaNO3, 2. Remember, anything with nitrate is soluble. And then I have silver coming over here with calcium. They're both uh, 1 plus and 1 minus ions, so I just get AgCl. I should figure out its state. If this one was aqueous, then I suspect this one's going to be the solid precipitate, but I will double check. And so there's chloride. I look down my list here. Most things are soluble. And now I'm just looking for the presence of silver, which there it is. And so AgCl is a slightly soluble compound and doesn't play nicely with water. And so there's my precipitate. I should go through and balance this one. Nitrate or uh, chloride makes a good starting point. I'll start with chloride just because. And so two Cl's, but only one over here. Double this. I now have to fix my silvers. Double that. I now have two nitrates, but I already have two here, so that's good. And calcium is already balanced. So now I can start putting in my information. Please organize it vertically underneath your chemical compounds. So my quantity of silver nitrate, 0.275 moles, should be uh, written here with units. Everything works in columns underneath. When we get into the more complex ones in Chem 30, there'll be lots of things to organize in these columns. So do yourself the favor and do it as I show you. Any deviation from it is just going to lead to confusion and make it harder to learn. Okay, so do what your teacher tells you and write it underneath those particular parts. We now did figure out what we're looking for. We were looking for the amount of precipitate in moles. We identified our precipitate, so we want to find out how many moles of this are being produced. Since we're given an initial quantity in moles, we don't have to do any conversion this time. This is the most simplified that Stoic can look. So here's what we do. We write down our quantity, 0.275 moles, and I actually put in the species. You remember doing this when we were looking at it in gas laws, and you remember doing this uh, when we saw it in uh, solutions. We followed the species through the balanced equation. So I have 0.275 moles of silver nitrate. Since I'm already in a mole quantity, I can go do my stoichiometry and I can go to my mole fraction from the equation. Now, I don't want information on silver nitrate, so I want to cancel that out. 
but what I do want is information on silver chloride. Using the species and writing them down from the chemical equation allows us to correctly put the mole fraction in in the right order. You're using information about silver nitrate to learn information about silver chloride, so silver nitrate is essentially a quantity or species to be cancelled out. The numbers for this fraction come from your balanced equation. So I will color code them here, but in this equation there are two parts or two moles of AgCl produced for every two parts or two moles of AgNO3 used. AgNO3 now cancels and now you have moles of AgCl, which is what you were looking for. So you can see that 2 over 2 simplifies to just 1, so I would get the exact same mole quantity of AgCl. All right, but AgCl is a slightly lighter uh, molar mass than AgNO3, and so we would find out that these two mole quantities would weigh different on a scale. The masses are not comparable, but the mole count is. Okay, I'll do the next example um, in the next video, and we'll just keep going through these examples in the next few videos. Okay, I hope that one made sense. Maybe try number two on your own. Come up with that balanced equation before you sign into the next video, and we'll see how she goes.